I do have a projecting voice, so I might have to turn it up a little more for you, Jen. <laughs> Um, all right, well, you, I'll wait for the signal. You can give me the thumbs up. We're going. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Annie Notary. For those that I haven't met, I'm the Women's Ministry Coordinator here at New Life. Um, and I get to work with um, Pam Baird and Sarah Gamage. If they will just stand and wave Pam's in the back there. Sarah's right here. So the three of us, we, we have this like really fancy name that we call ourselves the women's Bible study admin team. <laughs> um, but we, yeah, we just coordinate the Bible study and um, the three of us work really well together as a team. And we just, we want to see this study flourish. We love it. And we've all um, personally really grown from it. So reach out, feel free. Um, you can text, email any of us. Um, I am the paid staff person. So um, feel free to reach out to me first if, you know, especially if you have some sort of logistical issue. Um, so yeah, I, I'll just jump in and talk about why we're here. And so it's called women's Bible study. Cause we really do study the Bible. <laughs> um, and, um, our view of the Bible and scripture is that it is God's word to us and it is truth and it is life. Um, and we just view it as we are coming to God's word and asking like, filter all of life through God's word, through that grid, instead of kind of having our ideas, our view of life and filtering God's word through that. Um, and the reason that we do that is because that's what, how God's word describes itself. Um, in, in second Peter, it says that scripture was written um, by people through the inspiration of the Holy spirit. Um, and second Timothy three three sixteen says all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man, woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So I realize those are big claims and big promises for scripture to make of itself. But I think if you talk to a lot of us in this room, we have really seen that bear fruit. We've seen it um, come to fruition. So if this is all new to you, if you haven't experienced this view of God's word before, please just come talk to me, email me. Um, I have resources on, you know, the validity of God's word that I would love to share with you. Um, and what we really also love about this study is that it's not just God's word out there in an intellectual way. It's God's word for us personally. And we get to really read it, pray about it, um, understand how it interacts with our experiences, our lives. Um, and God really does that work. He's amazing. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, if there's something that feels intimidating to you, some of these passages in Romans are a little tricky. So I would just really encourage you to just each time before you sit down to do your lesson, just pray and ask the spirit to show you, you know, what this passage is really about. Um, and we've, we've found him really faithful to answer those prayers. Um, okay, so... That's, uh, you know, what we're doing here. The how we do it is, um, you know, from week to week has three major components. The first is the questions, which are in your gorgeous study guide. You see Erin Ammon, thank her for the, for the design work. And she and Jan worked really hard on putting this all together for us. Um, so I do want to say about the questions, um, we do use them um, in the discussion time in the small group. But really, their main purpose in the booklet is to give you time in the word alone with the Lord yourself. So we sort of see that as the base layer of the cake that we're building. And um, if you don't have the base layer, you only get a two layer cake, which is not really as yummy. So you want all three layers. It's really good. Um, so and also Sue lets you always say this, which I think puts it so well. You don't want to breathe the fumes of somebody else's experience. You want to drink fully yourself. So just get in the word yourself and um, instead of just kind of living through, you know, whoever gave the talk or the small group discussion, it will, it will really um, enrich your experience of the study a lot. Um, I do want to say it's totally okay if you don't know the answer. <laughs> it's not a great quiz. Um, and it's also okay if you bring up a question in your small group and your small group leader doesn't know the answer. We um, are just people who love Jesus. We're not, um, you know, 
biblical scholars. So it's totally fine for the small group leaders to say, I don't know. It's a great question. We'll get back to you. But please do bring your questions. I know I love it in my group when we can process something that, you know, somebody is confused about or didn't understand. And I feel like a lot of times that leads to just a uh, better understanding for all of us. So definitely it's a safe place to bring those questions. Um, so we do start every morning at 915. And the idea is if you have kids, you can drop them off. If um, downstairs at 915, you can come grab some coffee. Um, and then we really aim on a normal week to start our teaching by 930. I know this one is a little flex because of the social time and us getting all back in the groove. But um, we do try hard to start on time. So we do ask if you could just grab your coffee before 930 so that we can kind of be all seated and together. Um, and I do. So we have a couple noise comments. One is this door in the back is obnoxiously loud. And for some reason, whenever like you let go of the handle, it makes this really loud click. <laughs> so I taped it today, but I might not remember to tape it every week. But if you can just hold the handle down and really slowly release it if you come in when the door is closed. Um, and then along those lines, um, I know some of the moms with new babies need to sit in the back. That is great. We love having the moms here. We love the babies. But if they are just getting a little chatty, if you can take them out into the hall or one of those rooms, it's, it helps with the recording noise too. This room has terrible acoustics. I'm sorry. I didn't design it. <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't have good acoustics even if I did design it. But, um, so, and then I do want to say that our teachers are just fellow, like, I'm sorry, I know. <laughs> um, our teachers are just lay women from the church, and um, they are not scholars either, but they have um, spent a lot of time in the word and a lot of time in their passage, doing a lot of study, um, and they get to share with us what they've learned, which is such a gift. Um, and I do want to say, we get to hear from over 20 different women. So that's pretty amazing. And Ron Lutz always says that our church has an embarrassment of riches. And I do feel like it shows in this Bible study that we get to hear from so many different perspectives, life experiences, um, the way that God meets us individually as we study. So it is really a blessing that I love that part of our, our Bible study. Um, okay, so then around 10, we break into small groups for discussion and prayer. Um, we discuss, you know, the passage that you have studied um, previously, um, Lord willing. And <laughs> um, so I just want to introduce all our small group leaders now. Um, if you'll stand and if you didn't, if you don't know who your small group leader is, um, you should have heard from them. But if you didn't, that's totally fine. Just come see me and I will get you pointed in the right direction and connected to the right person. Okay, so we have Nancy Beal and Tracy ID. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I won't make you stand the whole time. Um, Beth Jenkins in here and Kim King. Kim. Um, Jennifer Kanak. Here she is. Maureen Jose is away. So wait, who's filling in? Linda Ruth. Okay, so Linda Ruth, if you're in Maureen's group, Linda Ruth is filling in. Um, I'm Annie. I think my group all knows me, but um, Lisa Roberts is right there in the back, our tech experts. Um, and Janet Snyder is away, um, but Ellen Kay is going to fill in for her. So where did Ellen Kay go? Yeah, so Ellen Kay is right here. Yep. Um, and Nancy Wilkinson. All right. And then Cheryl Radcliffe and Pat Salt, they also lead groups, but they're down in childcare with their groups today. Um, so I do want to say our hope and prayer for the small groups is that it is a time where you can point each other to Jesus, that as you see him in the scriptures, you can speak that, that truth to one another. Um, and it's a time to, you know, sort of process what you're hearing and understanding and how it intersects with your life. Um, but just remember that your small group can't solve all your problems in life. <laughs> Um, sorry, we just, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, but we're, we're not, yeah, we're not professional counselors. Um, we're just sisters walking alongside you in the Lord. Um, and our time is really short. There's usually only 45 minutes for that discussion time. So it means that you probably won't get a chance to share necessarily the heart of what's going on in your week every time, which I know is hard, 
But I'm really encourage you all to follow up with each other outside of that time, text, email, call each other, check in. Um, and that is kind of another way that you, another avenue you can use to share, even though our actual, you know, physical face-to-face -face time is so short. Um, so yeah, even though, you know, these women can't solve your problems, they can, you know, walk alongside you and assist you as the Lord, um, you know, does the work in your life. Um, so yeah, our groups end at 11. If you have children, please just leave. I hate this. I know it was so hard for me when I was a young mom too, but it's the only way we've figured out for it to work out for the, for the kids. They're usually done by then. The teachers are maybe a little done by then. Um, so, um, yeah, we, I asked all the small group leaders to set a timer. So if that timer just goes off, if you can just get up and leave, I know even if it's in the middle of prayer, I hate it, but, um, it's just the way that we figured out to make it work. Um, and we do have Cheryl McCann is amazing. And she is teaching our preschoolers again this year. So if you see her, give her a hug and a huge shout out. Um, she's, yeah, she's just really a gift and does so well with that class. Um, we were able, we just yesterday, VA and I just um, hired a new um, childcare person. So that is a huge answer to prayer. Keep praying, we'd love a couple more, but Lord willing, she will start next week. Um, so, you know, about three times a year, each group helps with childcare. Um, right now, it's just the way that we've figured out to watch the kids and have the moms be here and be present with us. Um, so we do see it as a privilege to be able to, to love our little ones and to be able to serve them that way. Um, so we really are counting on you to be here and partake in that time. Um, and the schedules are listed on the, the handout that was out there, the schedule. So if you can even just you know, put them all in your phone or write them all in your calendar now to highlight, hey, I really got to schedule around this childcare week and be here and be present. It just helps so much. It really makes the flow of that morning a lot better. Um, and we do all need our clearances um, and which I know is a hassle, but compliance is important. So we want to be law abiding citizens. Um, and we do have a new requirement this year, which is to watch the ministry safe video which it's just another layer of protection for our kids. We want to love our kids and protect them well. So um, I would, yeah, just if you haven't done that yet, take the time, sit down, do it. There's a short quiz at the end. And um, Tara will be following up with you and checking and making sure that you have all your clearances and everything before you're clear to serve in child care. But you will save me a lot of angst <laughs> if you just get it done. Um, so I, I do want to just say a word about attendance too. Um, I know that there are days when it is hard to get here. Crazy things happen, you know, crop pots explode, tires get flat, kids spill Cheerios and milk all over the carpet. Um, and Sue used to tell this story um, about um, how one of her kids literally set their homework on fire <laughs> on a Wednesday morning. <laughs> so she like, they brought it to her to sign, you know, of course that morning, right before school and put it on the stove, which the burner had just been on. It <laughs> just literally like, poof. <laughs> so crazy. So all that to say, we know these crazy things happen because we have an enemy who doesn't want us to be here, who doesn't want us to gather and study God's word um, and pray together and speak truth together. So, um, all that to say, if you can't get here, don't give up. Don't give up. Keep keep pursuing. Um, call your small group. Say, hey, pray for me. I'm feeling the battle to get here. Um, and definitely watch the videos. We have this wonderful team back here um, who can, records these videos for us, and they are posted online. You can even listen to it as a podcast. Um, I'll sometimes do that as I'm doing the dishes if I if I miss a week. So don't get discouraged and quit. There, keep persevering and keep asking for a prayer. Um, I would also say, just now, you're here. You, you took the time to register. You, you know, did all the steps and you actually got here. So make this one of the big rocks in your jar. You know, the analogy, if you have a pile of big rocks and a pile of small rocks in a jar, if you put the small rocks in first, you can't fit the big rocks. But if you put the big rocks in, the small rocks fit around the big rocks. So make women's Bible study one of the big rocks in your week and fit all the other things in around it. And um, yeah, I think you'll really reap the benefits of that, um, of the time together and the sisterhood. Um, 
So one of the things that I just really hope that you will see this year is that God gives us something far more powerful than a change in circumstances or sort of getting what we're praying for or hoping for, but he gives us himself and he gives us a relationship with our Lord and Savior. And um, as we study Romans, it's just such a beautiful picture of his love for us through the gospel and the way that he, you know, seeks us out. Um, so I just really am praying for each of you that you will experience that this year. All right. So Jan. Yes. Yes. Our purple video team. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So she's just saying for the video, this center aisle, if you can avoid walking up and down while we're videoing, because yeah, you do kind of walk right in front of somebody. But yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let me transition to Jan. Yeah. Yes, I want to get this you all on so I actually can walk around. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Smart idea. Yes. Yeah. So how does this go so this on? Clips. Can you have a pocket if you need to clip it in? I can. Great. Does it go on there? Get on there, sweetie. Get on me and do it. Perfect. Perfect. All right. All right, great. I'm going to pray for Jan. Lord, thank you so much for just this time together. Thank you for Jan and just all the time and energy she has spent um, in Romans this summer, um, putting together the booklet and preparing to give us this overview. Thank you for this inductive Bible study method and the way that it can be really useful um, for us to grow in our understanding of your word. So I just pray that this time would be helpful for all of us and that it would bring you glory. In your name, amen. 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 Let's get organized here. Oh, hi. <laughs> it's wonderful to look out and see your faces, I have to tell you. Good morning. Good morning. All right. I'm so excited to be here with you all today um, because today is the beginning, right? go together we are going to have the privilege of diving deep being saturated in the boundless sea of the gospel because that's what romans is yes it's going to be a year of discovery a year to study what martin luther called the bright light of the scripture the Apostle Paul's epistle to the Romans. Hmm. Romans has been called the most complete description of the gospel in the entire New Testament. Of course, it's also been called the gorilla of the New Testament <laughs> and theology on steroids. So I guess that means that Romans is probably not a walk in the park. But here's another description of Romans the most important letter in all of human history. Or the title, ta-da, on our Women's Bible Study booklet, the doorway to the treasure of all of scripture. And another one that's very similar, a lens through which all of scripture can be understood. Romans reveals what God's purpose was all along, throughout all of the Old Testament. Romans is a lens, a light, a doorway through which each of our personal stories can be filtered, given purpose, meaning, and reborn. As we come to understand equally the depth of our brokenness, 
and the immensity of God's love for us in Jesus. Dealing with the brokenness and the beauty of the Roman churches, Paul, step by step, logically, persistently, hews his way through a flood of thoughts to explain the meaning of God's work in Christ. Ancient Romans yearned to be right with God, just as we do now. We are all desperate for Jesus, the only way to be right with God. While understanding the context of Paul's letter is important to grasping the gorilla, because this is a letter and not a story or a narrative with characters, the historical context is especially important. Context will ground you as you study. So that is where we're gonna begin. The who, what, where, when, why, and how of the epistle to the Romans. First of all, the who. Who's involved with this letter? Where was it written and delivered? And when did all of this happen? Naturally, we know that Paul wrote it. Paul, a Pharisee who literally hated Christianity with murderous intensity and was confronted by the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus around 33 to 34 AD, the very dawn of Christianity. In that instant, his life was totally changed. On that road, Christ gave Paul his life's work, the work of a servant, the work of a witness to spread the gospel throughout the entire known Gentile world. About 24 years have passed, and in 57 AD, Paul is on his third missionary journey. He's staying with a friend, Gaius, who hosts a house church in the city of Corinth, Greece. And it was in this very house that the letter to the young, tiny little Roman churches was written. Paul had established the church at Corinth on his second missionary journey while traveling with Silas. And now on his third journey, Paul has big plans for the future. The letter he writes in Corinth is one step toward those plans. A trained scribe named Tertius wrote down Paul's words. Tertius was likely a slave or a former slave and a Christian, possibly from Rome, as he greets Christian believers there. Another interesting person involved with this letter is Phoebe. Phoebe is from Sincrea, a town east of the port of Corinth, and she carried the letter to the churches in Rome. Some commentators believe that she read it aloud to congregations. Wait, when I say congregations, that sounds like a big group of people, right? No, we're talking about little groups of people, about family-sized groups of people. Most assert that even if she didn't read the letter aloud to them, she was the first person to respond to some tough questions from the audience. Imagine that Phoebe, a woman in that time, is the first theologically astute person selected by Paul himself to answer questions arising from Romans. Phoebe is highly commended by Paul as trustworthy, a patroness of many, including Paul himself, and a servant or a deaconess. Now, some historical context would help us here. Acts 18.2 and other sources from the time tell us that under the emperor Claudius, Jews, this is including Jewish Christian leaders like Priscilla and Aquila, they were expelled from Rome in the late 40s because of angry disputes in the synagogues about Christus or Christ. From what we read in Acts and also in other letters of Paul's, these kinds of heated arguments were pretty common and could lead to riots. 
not exactly what Rome would like. At this point in history, Rome viewed Christianity as just a Jewish sect. So disruptions led to punishment of the whole Jewish community. Now Claudius dies and Nero uh, becomes emperor. They think he's going to be an improvement. They figure that out <laughs> pretty soon, that he's not. Nero becomes emperor, and Jewish Christians slowly filter back to Rome in around 54 AD, possibly because of the expulsion and the shifting in leadership. Tensions develop between scripture-saturated Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians who are more naive to the Mosaic law. And this tension between the two groups is something that Paul addresses in his letter. You know, God's timing is just an amazing thing. The expulsion of some or all of the Jews from Rome was just a foretaste of what was up ahead. Only a few short years after Paul's letter arrived, vast areas of Rome burned. By this point, the Roman authorities saw Christian believers and Jews of the synagogue as two separate groups. Blaming the Christians for the fire, Nero initiated the first systematic state-sponsored persecution on July the 24th, 64 AD. Arrested, tortured, thrown to wild beasts, and crucified. Christians were rounded up and sacrificed. The persecution began in Rome, but it spread to other Roman provinces as well. Paul's letter had given early Christians in Rome time to unify, time to put on the full armor of the gospel in Christ. In Paul's letter, God prepared them to face the lions with gospel hope. Persecuted Christians around the world today hold fast to that same hope. We don't face direct persecution here, but we do face challenges to our faith, national turmoil, suffering, heartache, and death. Reflecting on those early believers in Rome is a reminder that God always prepares us for what's up ahead and assures us that glory with him awaits. Who is he writing to? Paul's never been to Rome before, though he knows some believers there very well and he greets them in chapter 16, Priscilla and Aquila, dear friends from Corinth, have returned to Rome by this time. And he also has a couple of relatives that live there. His heartfelt greetings remind us that this is a real man writing to real people. Most of the Christians in Rome were people he hasn't met. The house churches, are made up of a mixture of Gentiles and Jews, Jewish Christians, and Christians meet in these family-sized groups for study of the Old Testament scripture. They worship together. They have a lot of fellowship time. They do a lot of eating together. They meet for evangelism, and they meet to organize ministries for the communities in which they live. For the most part, others have converted these Christians, not Paul. Some likely heard Peter speak at Pentecost, as Luke mentions that Jews from Rome were in Jerusalem for the very Passover when Jesus was tried and crucified. 
In the roughly 23 years since the first clusters of baby Roman churches were formed, many other Gentiles in Rome also became Christians. The little churches are growing. What was Paul's purpose in writing this letter? Since Paul hasn't been to Rome before, this letter is an important way of introducing himself, and Paul plans a new mission journey, this time to Spain. But first, he must deliver a collection to poor Christians in Jerusalem where famine rages. Spain was the farthest reaches of the known world, and Paul longs to preach the gospel there. He hopes to use Rome as a base for launching this mission, and he seeks their support. Paul clearly believes that sharing the gospel in its fullest form is his best introduction to people that he doesn't know. And in this letter, as I said before, we have the most complete description of the gospel in the entire New Testament. So what is the gospel? Well, Ray Ortland summarizes it like this. The gospel is good news for bad people. Yeah, good news for bad people through the finished work of Christ on the cross and the endless power of the Holy Spirit received with the open hands of faith. Chapters <clears throat> one through five tell how the gospel saves us by faith. Chapters six through eight and 12 through 15 describe how the gospel changes us. The dominant thread running throughout is the spectacular power, justice, wrath, and mercy of God's righteousness. The righteousness of God, there's that word, righteousness again. The righteousness of God occupies a central place in his salvation plan. God demands that we live in perfect obedience, perfect righteousness. But he knows that we can't. It's impossible for us. So God offers righteousness to us as a free gift of grace in Christ, received by faith. Does God give us this gift because we deserve it? No. He gives it out of love. He gives us this glorious gift because this is who he is. Perfectly holy and just, equally loving and merciful. This is the God we worship and adore. What was the impact of Paul's letter in church history? Well, many church leaders tell of very personal and dramatic encounters with Romans. Augustine, Martin Luther, John Wesley, and Karl Barth are just a few. Romans was the spark that lit the Reformation. Like thousands of believers over 2,000 years, many of the verses that you read on its pages will be so familiar. Some you've memorized and will feel like old and dear friends. Some you have clung to your whole life long, a touchstone, a gleaming jewel that speaks clearly of God's grace in Jesus to your innermost heart. How do we understand Paul's letter to Romans? Well, Romans can feel complicated. Knowing something about Paul's writing style, though, can be very helpful. Paul uses a writing style that was familiar to ancient Romans, and it's an instructional dialogue called a diatribe during his day. Though Romans begins and ends like a letter, let me tell you, it's not your typical letter. The body of Romans carefully builds this instruction 
on how the righteousness of God infuses every part of the gospel. I called Romans an instructional dialogue, right? Well, my goodness, it's one guy writing a letter. Where's the dialogue? Paul writes as if he is speaking to an imaginary questioner or an opponent. So as you're reading, imagine that there are two voices speaking, Paul's and his questioners. This forms one of the underlying structures, the basic underlying structures of Romans. So it's a real important piece to grasp. Paul actually uses 85 questions in Romans. He uses questions from chapters 2 through 14 as a way to move his argument along. Paul's questions are like Hansel and Gretel's little, you know, breadcrumbs. They show us the trail to follow. Many questions form transitions in his expanding argument. A question or a series of questions from his imaginary opponent is asked, and then Paul follows it up with the layers of his answer, brick upon brick upon brick. While reading, try circling the question marks so that they pop off the page. This will help you to track Paul's argument. There's quite a few important theological terms in Romans. And you'll find some of these terms defined in your workbook, in your workbook, alongside the chapter one passage. Elaborate sentence patterns are used throughout Romans. So one suggestion is that you try reading aloud, because reading aloud helps break up Paul's long sentences into these meaningful chunks. A good thing about reading aloud is that hearing your own voice allows you to hear the cadence of Paul's voice. And many of us honestly learn best through our hearing anyway. So reading aloud gives your brain a boost when tackling complex language. Be alert to repeated words or phrases because repetition in Paul's letter points to the current theme. For example, the words God, Christ, and righteousness are repeated throughout the book. Love is used six times in just two verses in chapter 13. Pretty important word there. Mercy, flesh, the law, sin, slave, weak and strong, Jew and Gentile, death and the spirit, each is heavily repeated in certain passages. So look for that repetition. His use of repetition helps the reader to follow Paul's thoughts. If you eliminated all the function words, and by function words, I mean things like the, a, and, words like that, right? The word that Paul uses most frequently is God, about 160 times. God is best and most fully known by what God has done in Christ. And the gospel is all about Christ. Unlike 1 and 2 Samuel that we studied over the past two years, where God was in the background in Romans, he is front and center. You can expect to learn a lot about God in Romans. Paul uses analogy, like the church as the body of Christ, and adoption to characterize our new relationship with God the Father. He frequently compares and contrasts opposites, such as slaves to the flesh or slaves to God, died with Christ or alive with him, under the law and under grace. He points to famous 
and representative people from the past as examples. Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, Jacob, and Esau. Paul quotes Old Testament passages to ground his writing in scripture, especially for Jewish Christians. And Paul looks back at these same patriarchs and reinterprets them through the lens of the gospel. Whole new understanding. Unlike many of you until recently, <laughs> I've never studied Romans before. I was a novice. Many verses were familiar, but reading Romans through once and then twice left me with partial understanding. I had a lot of questions. I was reminded of something that Pam Baird said. The Bible is written in God's love language, and God's love language in Romans can be pretty tough to understand. So here's an approach that I've found while digging into Romans especially. Many of you are familiar with the inductive Bible study method. So it's a study method that's simply described in a handout you picked up on the way in. Looks like this. I know it's really tiny, but you, you know what I mean. Okay. You pick this up on the way in. And the same method is really helpful for studying any passage of scripture. The ideas in here and in the inductive method are not rocket science. And as you work your way into Romans, you may find some or all of them useful. Before we get into going through that handout, I would like to encourage all of you to take time now, before you begin reading the individual passages, to read through the entirety of Romans so that you take that complete understanding of where Paul is headed with you. You know what the end is, and you take that understanding with you to each individual passage that you're going to study very, very deeply. So now, about the handout. Okay, so if you have that out, that could be helpful. But the other thing that would be helpful for you, um, in your workbook, which is, I'm assuming that, you know, a lot of you are probably taking your notes on this page, right? Intro to Romans. And you probably at this point are saying, um, it probably should have been about three pages. <laughs> Sorry, um, because Aaron and I filled up half the page <laughs> with this bottom section right here. I want to thank Erin for so many things. But um, she included these two prayers. As you approach your study of each individual passage, we wanted to make it abundantly clear that your study must start in prayer. And this prayer that she wrote for us um, here, I think it's just so perfect. Because what it highlights is that in that prayer, before you begin your study, you're bringing to God, you're saying, Lord, these are my joys this week. And here's what I'm struggling with. I I just ask you that you please work with me in this passage to find something that is going to speak into my life directly. And Lord, help me to understand what it is you have for me here in Romans. And that's the way to begin your study each time so that you know that you and the Holy Spirit are working like a team together. And that's the best approach, I think. That's the best beginning that you can possibly make. So, with that in mind, prayer is number one. You'll notice there are numbers here, one, two, three, and four. Prayer 
is number one. And then in this inductive Bible study method, co next comes observation, then interpretation, and then application. And that gives you your numbers one through four. So I'm gonna say just a few things about each one of those pieces of your work. For observation, you'll notice that there are three readings that are suggested here. And each reading is gonna take you deeper and deeper into your understanding of the passage. Each reading uses a combination of your senses to dig deeper. It's using your hearing, your sight, your touch, your emotions. It's also using your ability to question as you go. As you're reading, you're contemplating questions about what Paul is saying. And, and the answers to those questions are going to lead you to deeper understanding as well. But each of your senses contributes in a big way to understanding. Now, most of the uh, passages that you're studying on a weekly basis, let me get, get to chapter one here. And if you, you can see, I think you can even see it from all the way in the back almost. Um, there is a lot of white space. This isn't like first and second Samuel where we were oh, solid print, right? No, uh, there's a lot of white space here. You've got big text. The text is a large font. You've got lines down the side at the margin. So you've got a lot of space to work with, which is great when you're doing inductive Bible study. Just super. So use that type, use that white space, use those margin lines to make notes, write questions, draw connecting lights, and generally work your way through the passage. So on your first reading, this is where I suggest that you read the passage aloud. So you can feel the cadence Feel the emotions of what Paul is writing. Uh, and there's a lot of emotion in Romans, a lot of it. Reading aloud, again, helps you to hear Paul's language, to break those complex sentences up into more meaningful chunks, and to generally get a feeling for the passage, touch base with Paul and his audience, and then glean this general understanding and it gives you a chance to then note main topics. And maybe that's just your goal in the first reading, right? Your second reading is to focus more upon the details in the passage, the details. Um, and I think I have written down here on the worksheet, um, more like the WH questions. You know, who is involved in the passage and what's happening and where and when is it happening? Not the general questions about Romans in general, but specific to this passage. Okay. Now, if you get confused, and if you're me, you will, um, write your questions down. You know, they may be questions you can't solve right there in the moment, but you wanna capture them. They're important. So write them down in the margin. And then on your third reading, you're gonna be taking more of the deepest dive that you take. Now here, you're gonna work with the, the passage in the way that it talks about on the inductive Bible study sheet. Uh, just a few words about that. Uh, circling question marks. Remember that Paul's questions drive his thoughts throughout chapters two through 14. So you wanna circle those question marks. Highlight words that are repeated frequently. Maybe box words or phrases. Box them. Put them in little boxes. Uh, words or phrases that compare or contrast. Um, circle connecting words. They are so important. Words like for, 
therefore, so, if, words like that, they're showing you that there's a transition or a conclusion that Paul is making. So they are, they're like little stoplights for you. Those connecting words, really important. So you want to circle those. Circling, boxing, underlining, using keyword symbols, make the passage and Paul's meaning become more visual. The other thing that they do, which is really cool, is they involve your hands in the work. Another sense, right? So, wait a second, keyword symbols. I need to say something about that, right? Um, keyword symbols. On the sheet, inductive Bible study, there is a link right here in the conveniently eye-popping blue. So it stands out for you, you can see it there. So that link, is going to take you to a page. I know this is eensy beensy, but it, you can see it well enough to note. It's got lots of colors, lots of words on this. This single page is different key word symbols for very important terms and words that are part of Romans. It's, it says Romans at the top, just for Romans. So, um, this is going to be a very helpful tool for you if you find keyword symbols to be useful in your work. But I want to show you a little bit bigger than that tiny paper. So this is what I mean by keyword symbols. Simple, simple to use. Simple, simple to write. We know gospel. Big emphasis in Romans. This is gospel. That's a symbol for gospel. It's a megaphone. Yo, good news here, right? Megaphone, little circle, little triangle, boop, boop, boop. A megaphone. God, a triangle, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. A great big R for righteousness. If it happens to be unrighteousness, a great big R with a line through it. All right, repentance, I love this one, huh? Repentance, why? I'm going one way. And now I'm going back the opposite direction. I not only confess, but I change. I turn around and I go the opposite way by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love that one. The law, a little book. Spirit. Now that's my flame. I know it kind of looks like a bear paw <laughs> or something like that, but I know what it means. That's what's important is that you know what it means. Okay, Christ. Or Jesus Christ, same thing. A line and a cross. Slave, two little circles and a chain. Shackles. Shackles. Okay, so when I say keyword symbols, they are simple, simple. But the use is um, very uh, profound. When you go back and you look at that page again, it helps to give you, one again, visually, this general impression of exactly what Paul is saying in the text. So um, that's one of the uses for keyword symbols. Colors are helpful if you like to use those. Um, you can use those too. And um, you may also want to use arrows to connect your thoughts or uh, numbers. Say there's a sequence of ideas, and Paul does this too. Number, numbering them will help to give you some additional help there. All right, now we're moving past observation and into interpretation. So when you move to this step in your uh, study of the passage, this is a time to address those questions about the passage. You may want to read a little further in Romans to seek an answer. Uh, if you can't find it there, you may want to reflect on other scripture that you think uh, could be related to this piece of Romans. One way to find that is if you have an ESV study Bible, the commentary at the bottom is really helpful because it will oftentimes give you references to other scripture within the Bible so you can check in other places to find answers. So that's another resource. Um, I like, oh, this is helpful too. Uh, this is something, a Bible dictionary. Um, J.I. Packer put this one together. And 
is also helpful. Maybe when you're having problems with a certain uh, theological terms, you know, so that's, that's a helpful thing. Um, I, I wouldn't stress out over commentaries in general. I, there are a couple of them that I do like. One's John Stott's on Romans and the other one's um, Tim Keller's. Very, very accessible. So if you're seeking answers and you're really into it, you might want to try those as well. The other thing to be doing at this point where you're interpreting the interpretation section is to answer those passage questions that are in your workbook. Finally, application. So application is just simply distilling what you've learned from your observation, your readings and observation, and analyzing, and, um, and also your interpretation, taking that and distilling it by maybe paraphrasing or um, writing down what you think is a, an important theme um, or writing down what you have learned about God. What, what have I learned in this passage about God that's different, that strikes me as different and new? What about, what have I learned about faith or grace? Or what have I learned about my walk with Christ? And then here is your chance at the end to just thank God for what he's showing you and ask him to help you live out what you've learned. So then that's the conclusion of your study um, of the passage. Now, alert. This sounds like a lot, right? <laughs> right? But I want to just say, this is not something to stress over. It's a learning process, you know? So take your time. Take your time. I hope that you do have that time that you can set aside to, to explore Romans in depth in this way. Rely on the Holy Spirit to guide your thinking. Listen for his voice and relax. You will become familiar with Paul's style. You're going to become familiar with the cadence of his writing. It's going to become part of you. And you've got a year to do it. So relax. And just enjoy the beauty of what he reveals about God and his plan in Christ for you. I mean, God gave Romans to you, right? He wants to be known by you. If you ask, the Holy Spirit will open your heart and inform your mind. If you feel stuck, bring questions to your group so we can all learn and grow together. Finally, this is a book that will challenge your intellect as you follow Paul's intricate thoughts step by step to reveal the perfect holiness and mercy of God. Even more, this book will move your heart to praise and worship. This is a book that shifts one's soul like an earthquake. In Romans, the gospel truth about Jesus breaks through our fears and failings. This good news is far better than you ever dreamed. In Romans, Jesus died for me, takes on a new assurance and a resounding hope. Let's pray. Oh Lord, guide us as we seek your face in the good news of Romans this year. Give us understanding. Father, fill us with awe and wonder that you would make a way for us to be righteous in Christ, not through our work, but through yours, that you would give your own son to die for us, all grace received by our open hands of faith. Bless the teaching, the 
the private study time, the group discussion and prayer. May we, may we learn to know and love you more through the words of Paul and through the work of your spirit.